little perspectives on managing financial crime compliance risk in a COVID-19 world. I'm Stephen Hill, co-chair of Denton's White Collar and Government Investigations a U.S. practice, and I'll be moderating our presentation today. Uh, before we begin, uh, we want to say on behalf of our panelists and our law firm that we hope you and those close to you are healthy and safe. We decided to do this webinar uh, in these uncertain times because we knew many of you are working in very different situations than you were a couple of months ago and might have real challenges facing you as you manage compliance risks. We hope we'll offer some practical perspectives from our regional panelists today as they share their thoughts on some of the issues we all face in the COVID world. Uh, during the webinar, if you have questions, I will keep an eye on the chat function uh, and, and try to work them in as we go along. One note on the chat function is that while I can see all of the submissions, you will only see your own submission and not those of, of, of others. Uh, we'll begin with an introduction of our panelists and we'll try and leave a little bit of time at the end uh, to catch up on those questions that come in through the chat function. Let me introduce to you your panelists today. Uh, the first is Brian O'Blinis. Brian practices in the U.S. White Collar and Government Investigations practice uh, and does criminal defense work focusing on global investigations, including FCPA and Competition Matters. Uh, his focus is on work that takes place all over the globe. Our second panelist is Anthony Cole. Anthony is joining us from Denton's Calgary office where he co-leads the region's white collar and government investigations practice for Canada. Uh, his practice involves acting for clients on investigation and defense work, both in the criminal setting and in the civil setting. Our third panelist is Carolina Munez, who is with us from San Jose, Costa Rica today. Uh, she uh, leads the criminal law and compliance teams for the Central American region uh, at the Denton's law firm and has also, besides her criminal defense work, has extensive uh, work in the compliance world. Uh, particularly with the ISO standards. Our final panelist joins us from Sydney, Australia. Ben Allen is a litigation partner in the Sydney office, and he heads up the white collar and government investigations practice for the Australia and surrounding nations region. So what we thought we would do today, and by the way, if you need additional information uh, about your panelists today, please go to the Denton's website or go to the invitation that you received. There should be a link for each panelist in case you wanna get back in touch with them. So we're gonna run through a, a, a series of themes today. And our first one today is going to be exposure to public sector uh, guidelines. Uh, for some companies, the exposure to the public sector engagement may be their first experience uh, and they, are having that experience as they seek assistance through new programs or respond to, to government calls for emergency support. I'm gonna start with Brian O'Blinis today. And Brian, in the US, uh, previous crises often present what may be a useful guide of what to expect from a compliance and enforcement perspective, although we all acknowledge that COVID-19 presents its own unique challenges. What previous examples of fraud and corruption activity do you think w might be a useful guide for our audience in these circumstances and what differences might we also expect? Brian? Thanks, Steve. You know, as we get started here and, I, and I've been thinking about our themes, I, I will say that I, I think because I'm a U.S. lawyer and I work on a lot of enforcement investigation that that, that tends to be my focus. I don't mean for a second to skip over the importance of compliance, but having worked with our colleagues, uh, all of our colleagues that are on the panel today, I know that they will um, make some excellent points that are applicable globally in addition to the regions they, they talk about. So I, I, think, I think you're gonna hear from me more of an uh, enforcement 
focus, um, but there will be plenty of compliance um, discussion, I'm sure. So uh, in response to the question, Steve, the, I mean, the one that sticks out most in my mind is during the 2008 recession when um, the U.S. government passed the Troubled Asset Relief Program, uh, better known as TARP, and the U.S. Congress appropriated $700 billion that was distributed, and they distributed it in a very short time. Um, at the time, the Congress also established something called the Special Inspector General of TARP, SIGTARP, and the first person who uh, was the Special Inspector General was a lawyer called uh, Neil Borofsky, and he estimated in his work that 10% of the money, 10% of that $700 billion that was appropriated was lost due to fraud. Um, and so his office secured uh, hundreds of criminal convictions and, and engaged in hundreds of investigations, and they recovered about $10 billion of that money that's lost to fraud. And so I, I think that and, and sort of the examples of crisis created by hurricanes, Chris, Katrina, Sandy, and Maria, and, and what we saw in the aftermath uh, you know, both from a public corruption standpoint, but also from individuals and companies engaging in fraudulent conduct to take advantage of that money flow. I think those kind of crises um, at least give us a, a lesson about what might happen here, because there's three times the money uh, appropriated under the tar uh, as under the tarps, so around 2.2, 2.3 2 trillion dollars. And I think a fundamental lesson is that uh, law enforcement officials, Department of Justice, and others who prosecute financial crimes uh, will be very active and I think very aggressive because of the environment that we're expediting the, the funds that are coming out. There are diminished controls. You know, some of the procurement processes are shortened, um, or most of them will be. There may be contracts that are uh, no bid contracts and as a result, it's a breeding ground for fraud. And so I think we'll see, um, the like in the past, I think we'll see aggressive enforcement. Thanks, Brian. Uh, let's go beyond the U.S. and, and talk with uh, the other panelists. Uh, beyond the U.S., governments in each of your regions are offering support, uh, whether it be stimulus opportunities for small and large businesses or some other kind of, uh, of, of connection to the, to the government to work on the challenges in, in your country. Um, I'm sure for many, this will be the first time the organizations have found themselves uh, having to, to deal in that situation. But I want to broaden it, and, and I'll ask this question first to, to Carolina. And then uh, I'd like to hear from Anthony and Ben both. Uh, what unique challenges do you see for organizations in your regions in responding to government assistance? Carolina, can you start us off? Sure. Um, basically, you know, also LATAM has the advantage that is learning from others' experience, or, or I hope that is the case. Um, and it's taking radical steps to be well before other countries that were first hit by COVID. Um, the truth is that in our region, uh, we do have a, I might say, weaker economic growth. And in some cases, the thing is that political, uh, politically weak governments um, have pre-existence in efficient administration, and that is also affected in many, many cases by corruption. So in that scenario, um, I, I can see that organizations might have problems not only internally in each of the countries they have operations, where the governments have implemented, uh, let's say, health and economic policies that basically uh, are changing on a daily basis, and, and lacking resources and training accountability is some of the cases um, that we have to deal with as, as companies. You know, policies are implemented, uh, as I mentioned, on a daily basis, and you just don't know how you have to deal with them because, you know, the government is not necessarily prepared to deal with that. And on the other side, I would say that there have been comments 
made about knowing the regional mechanisms to tackle the problem. So right now, uh, the problem uh, is being attacked strictly from a national level. And um, the problem is that if you have a company with operations all around the world, uh, let's say not only in Latin America, the way you comply with government regulations might change from one country to another. Uh, the other challenge that I see, uh, and this is information I, I have just received like 15 minutes ago, is that you have to deal with reputational matters where you as a company, if you are giving um, help to the government, you are kind of in the radar of the tabloids, and you have to be very careful as to the way you benefit beneficiate yourself, uh, you know, uh, or you conduct business nowadays with the government because everybody is going to have the eye on, on you, and you have to be very very careful as to define the rules of engagement with the government and 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 deal with your business um, locally. Thank you, Carolina, for giving the perspective from Central and Latin America. Uh, let's continue along the, the discussion of what the environment is out there from a regional perspective, and let's turn to, to Anthony Cole in, in Canada. Anthony, what's your, what's your sense of the unique issues that, that are uh, from a Canadian perspective? Sure. So uh, a couple of things that uh, strike me. The first is uh, that there's a lot of pressure uh, on the government not only to announce relief programs and stimulus packages but also to get those funds flowing extremely quickly. I think it's the same with other jurisdictions but I think what that leads to is that both the terms uh, and conditions and the oversight of the administration of some of those government programs or initiatives are not necessarily perfectly clear or perfectly well defined at least when they're first rolled out so there may well be some gray areas in there. Now, there's some pretty basic and, and obvious steps to take um, in relation to that, that factor. And the first is to you know, ensure you identify at least and understand the rules uh, such as they are and whatever le uh, latest guidance is available from the, uh, the government department responsible for the program. But also document the role of that guidance uh, in your decision making at the time so that you have something to point to if you end up having to defend a decision or an interpretation that is different to perhaps uh, others in due course. I'd, I'd note on that front that fraud is a pretty broad concept under Canadian law. Uh, it is a favorite of, uh, of the RCMP and, and the Federal Crown, but it does require intent or knowledge. So I think it's helpful to ensure you have a record at a corporate level showing earnest and, and good faith efforts to get things right. I think that reduces the risk of leaving a vacuum that can be filled by inference and circumstantial evidence or facing culpability for the actions of rogue individuals or third parties uh, lower down the chain or outside the chain. Um, the other significant risk area uh, is uh, in that there's a ton of potential touch points with uh, government officials right now arising from COVID-19. Uh, and uh, those officials are likely to be exercising uh, some measure of discretionary uh, decision-making power, uh, in whether that's in relation to the eligibility for existing programs, whether you're dealing with government officials and advocating for new programs or seeking classification or permitting as an essential business or to allow particular projects to proceed, or even in the context of bidding on large-scale procurement uh, for essential supplies. Uh, the, the things you need to be careful of in those contexts is the first, first thing is, is lobbying laws exist in Canada. And in Canada, there's, there's quite extensive ones, both at the federal and at various provincial levels and even at municipal level in, in some places. Um, but they're also quite broad in application. So, and and they, they, they apply any time you're, you're trying to you know, influence decision-making or affect policy. So particularly for those organizations that aren't used to dealing with government officials regularly, um, and may not have that infrastructure in place. Be, be cognizant of those, uh, at least in, in Canada. Um, but the second is, you know, very importantly, is, is corruption laws, anti-corruption laws. And those aren't just applicable to what's done in Canada, but they're also applicable to what Canadian companies and Canadian uh, nationals do abroad. I think corruption risks are, are pretty acute across the world right now. 
uh, not just in traditionally high-risk jurisdictions, but really because of the number of touch points and the novelty of the situation. As, as Brian mentioned, some countries have chosen to suspend or disapply normal open bidding rules because of uh, time sensitivity. But that presents an opportunity for corruption that, that some will take, and it's never an excuse to uh, corruption that, well, somebody else is doing it, or there was a we understood other people were about to do it. Uh, I also think you're going to get abnormal numbers of, or types of requests for, from foreign governments or municipalities for supplies or donations, and, and that's not necessarily problematic to respond to those. Um, but uh, you need to ensure that your policy framework allows you to, uh, to take those steps to respond to those outreaches. Uh, I think there's going to be a need to be flexible. Uh, you should be flexible. But make sure that if you are going to be flexible, exceptions to policies are approved at the right levels and the thinking behind them is documented and there's a documented risk assessment behind applying exceptions or you know, changing policies. Again, needs to be done at the right level. Otherwise, you run a pretty severe risk that the, uh, um, it, it becomes a bit of a rod to beat you with later down the line that you're ignoring your own policies and there won't be the kind of controls that ought to be applied if people are end running policies. Uh, before I hand over as well to Ben, or before we get Ben's comments, I just wanted to say, in terms of mitigating corruption risk or financial risk, uh, financial crime risk more generally, I think employees are going to be really important. Employees, intermediaries, so as agents or distributors, consultants, are going to have a really critical role in in navigating the compliance risk that exists right now. They can either be your greatest defence mechanism, or I think they're going to be your greatest vulnerability. I think it's particularly important to be clear with employees right now about the risk tolerance levels the company has, the organization has, in the specific circumstances they're likely to be facing and remind them of the key policy requirements around the types of engagement they're likely to have. Uh, you know, the competitive pressure is huge right now on employees and employees are going to feel under pressure uh, not only to identify scarce opportunities but to win them. And it's, it's critical that there's messaging around what the risk parameters they're operating in, what the, the company is going to tolerate in terms of, uh, of, of practices. And that message has to come from the top, it has to come from management, and it has to be done in consultation with compliance or legal. So those are really the, uh, the, the risks and some of the, the best ways of responding in the near term to, to those risks as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, ben, how about sharing your, your perspective on, on this topic? Sure, thanks, Steve. Um, just picking up on, on some of the themes, um, certainly the one Brian led with in relation to past crises, I think the um, experience in Australia from the GFC, um, which resulted in a, a um, stimulus program that led to a Royal Commission investigating that, including a terms of reference that looked at fraud, um, people are very alive to the fact that um, stimulus programs uh, can be ripe for fraud activity um, in Australia um, as well as elsewhere. Um, and like other jurisdictions, the Australian government has um, announced a, a raft of measures to get money out to small and large businesses very quickly. Um, and so I think the, the things that everyone's been talking about in, in relation to engaging with that in a, a very considered way um, are equally applicable for the Australia region. Um, just two uh, points that I want to add to, to the themes that have already been mentioned. The, the first is in relation to um, being alive to um, cyber risk. I think that's something that um, we are certainly uh, making sure organisations are aware of um, in, in Australia where outreach for um, offers of stimulus um, payments um, are coming from fraudsters uh, to engage or, or to, to try to engage with organisations for, um, for nefarious reasons and that's certainly something that compliance teams need to be very conscious of. Um, and the second is obviously something that Anthony just um, touched on, which is uh, making sure that compliance teams continue to be resourced and vigilant during this time, especially where they're engaging with um, government stimulus packages, um, because obviously staff cuts at the moment or, or um, furloughed activities um, are having a huge impact on workforces and making sure that um, the compliance roles are still well resourced um, is obviously going to be key to making sure that you don't trip up on any of the engagement with um, government. Thank you, Ben. So the, the next theme that we're going to turn to uh, is, so we've talked about sort of some environmental considerations 
uh, on a regional basis. And what we want to do now is turn to probably a question that would be on a lot of your minds, which is what is what is the anticipated enforcement and regulator response uh, to these circumstances? So I'm going to again turn to, to Brian to start us off on this topic. And Brian, for the for the U.S., how much and what do you expect to see from uh, the enforcement community, both at the federal and, and, and state level in the United States, both on the near term and long term? Thanks, Steve. So from, from my perspective at the federal level, um, we're, I think we're, we're talking about enforcement uptick, um, sort of in the six to 12 months out range. And so what I mean by that is the Department of Justice, Securities and Exchange Commission, Federal Trade Commission, other agencies that are that, that are uh, will will have in their jurisdiction uh, some of the potentially criminal conduct that we've talked about, financial crimes. Um, I think there will be a, an uptick in prosecutions. Um, you know, the SEC has been fairly consistent with its enforcement um, topics, but they have a broad range of things that they enforce on the on the issuer community and since it's a regu since they're the regulator i think they'll continue to have that function and be active they've been pretty consistent over time um, and and lately they've been heavily focused on internal controls and those things will will matter in this situation i mean we're i guess my thought on that is document 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 so that we have a record of things that are done um, as anthony was talking about before you know, for the DOJ, the, the primary concern that comes to mind is the False Claims Act, because people will be interacting with the government more as suppliers. They may be new to that area um, and participating in these financial programs. And there will be some exposure related to that. Um, you know, as the money flows, uh, the regulatory priorities and specifics are, are sometimes not in place yet. So we're building the aircraft as it's flying, and in some cases that there'll be some afterthought about how to approach uh, the inevitable fraud that will happen. I also see on the horizon uh, additional antitrust enforce enforcement. I think the environment is going to create uh, distressed assets, bankruptcies, things that create opportunities uh, in the market for companies that are able to survive um, and have cash to buy. So I do think there will be merger and, frankly, non-merger litigation because in an environment where companies are struggling, sometimes you see cooperation that's appropriate. Sometimes you see cooperation among competitors that's inappropriate. So I think um, antitrust will uh, also – antitrust enforcement will increase. And, uh, you know, it's, it's – under um, Megan Delrahim, DOJ Antitrust Division has been – Pretty aggressive already, mostly focused on technology. Um, I think that that'll swing around to healthcare, which is a favorite of DOJ. Um, and then finally, in the shorter run, uh, and some of this has begun already, the state attorneys general um, are already concerned about some of the practices uh, under state law, and you know, with fraud, fraud price gouging, consumer protection type. Uh, investigations have started, and I believe prosecutions will follow shortly after. Um, so I think in the short run, you'll see the states be more active, but I do believe the, the federal enforcement community um, will be up and running before too long and take on some of the same kind of fraudulent things we saw with some of these past events. That's a great overview, Brian. Thank you. Carolina, from your perspective in, in Central and South America and Latin America, uh, what's your sense of the enforcement calendar? Um, right now, um, nowadays, um, I would say that there is no necessarily that much movement uh, from our enforcement you know, um, in offices. Right now, the courts are, are closed and everybody is kind of tackling the problem and dealing with the emergency. But I don't think that will be the case uh, during the next month. Um, basically because as already Brian and, and, and Anthony said, you know, there is a lot of uh, risk right now because there is a lot of money outside. And 
companies, for example, are being requested to donate to government um, to deal with the, with the crisis. And what we have seen is that they tend to circumvent their own compliance policies. And the problem is that in order to attempt to the speed of the government requires, uh, basically they are overseeing not only their internal policies, but also, you know, the local laws. So things that uh, they are supposed not to do in the past, uh, you know, they are doing it right now. And, and everybody is, you know, kind of, of helping and way of, of, of thinking, but I don't think that, that will be the case in some companies where you don't you don't control what is going on, you don't have um, you know a proper compliance program to see what your employees are doing and to spread uh, you know the message about ethics and value that will be the case in other companies. So the problem is that for example in Brazil um, even though the investigation procedures are suspended, uh, the General Controller Union has uh, already conveyed the message that investigations will wrap up uh, once the quarantine is over. And basically what they are saying is that they will focus on those companies which have dismantled their compliance department. So right now what we, we are seeing is that uh, because of the emergency, and because of cost cutting reasons, uh, some compliance professionals are being laid off. And the problem with that is that somehow you, you know, you just don't care about that uh, very important issue on a long term uh, vision. So uh, even though our authorities are not doing anything proactive right now, I think that that won't be the case in the future. Many countries are going to change presidents, and you know that will be also a component that could have a, an element in the mix, and 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 that could um, you know speed up the process of enforcement activity in our region. Thank you, Carolina. Those were some um, interesting uh, observations about. Both the the political and the and the legal goings on in in Central and Latin America. Anthony, what's your crystal ball on uh, the enforcement calendar in in Canada? So I think uh, the reality is investigations, uh, both existing ones uh, and new ones, are likely going to move slower. I think that's just an operational reality. Um, but I think the point I'd make is that in Canada, at least, financial crime investigations don't move very quickly anyway, so I'm not sure there's going to be a huge amount of visible change there. But I do think that uh, in, on significant financial crime cases, including corruption, uh, the RCMP, uh, other law enforcement agencies, aren't just going to abandon these investigations or even shelve them for another day. It is not happening on my cases. I'm getting engagement on... Um, the cases I have with the, the RCMP uh, right now, including uh, foreign corruption cases. So I'm not seeing, you know, it pens down or huge reallocation of resources or anything like that. Um, I do think, though, that there is going to be a different approach to some investigations if this goes on uh, much longer, if, this, this, if the lockdown serious restrictions continue. Um, one of the things I'd, I'd note is that in Canada, the RCMP, on, particularly on corruption cases, have tended to use search warrants, um, but also on other serious financial crime cases. Search warrants are, are a popular device uh, relative to other jurisdictions, uh, and I, I don't think you're likely to see those being obtained or executed in the near term because of the logistical challenges around them. But I do think it will lead to switching to other avenues, and, and production orders are commonly used here, so, so third-party production orders commonly used here in secret with sealed uh, uh, supporting materials. And there may be a slightly longer in intelligence gathering process, but I could also see things like wiretaps being used more commonly in serious financial crime cases. They have been used in previous foreign corruption cases and in sanctions investigations before by the RCMP. Um, and I actually think they could be high yield because you may have more incriminating discussions happening on phone or email um, or text. Uh, because you can't have face-to-face -face discussions. Um, so I, I think that would be high yield, and I think it's available. In fact, the grounds may be stronger under COVID-19 because one of the requirements for wiretaps is that uh, 
other investigative avenues that are less invasive from a privacy standpoint either can't be pursued or, or wouldn't be effective, and they can establish that. There's, there's reasons why, pretty obvious reasons why, that might be satisfied more readily in, in the current circumstances. Um, unlike it in uh, how Brian sort of sees things going in the US, I don't expect we'll see a huge wave of near-term enforcement relating to the misuse of, of domestic programs in, in Canada. Um, I'm not saying that we won't see those in due course, but the, the simple fact is Canada doesn't have the same kind of enforcement resources as, as are available to the DOJ or the SEC. And you don't have the kind of proactive oversight or project-specific enforcement in infrastructure that Brian was talking about under the TARP program previously or the CARES Act. So I think that in Canada, it's quite possible a scandal emerges either in the media or through some kind of public inquiry. And I very much expect Canadian law enforcement to pick up you know, those sorts of, of cases. But I think it might take something to spark it rather than having the kind of huge um, oversight programs that are, that are going to be used in the U.S., um, the, the last thing I'll say is, is that, as, as other panelists have pointed out, uh, there is, you know, really uh, lots of opportunities for large-scale fraud, and it is likely happening as we're as we're speaking um, on huge government programs. You know, as, as Brian said, Hurricane Katrina, even you know, Deepwater Horizon compensation, uh, uh, sort of infrastructure or structures were subjected to huge amounts of, of fraud, and those are on a you know, much smaller scale than we're talking about here in terms of the size of government programs. So I think there's going to be a lot of fraud around, and for regulated entities, particularly those subject to anti-money laundering regulatory frameworks here in Canada, uh, are going to have to be very vigilant about identifying typologies and new, new risks. They are expected to adopt you know, risk-based compliance models and that the nature of risk and the frequency of risk, the scale of risk is changing. So I think at least, again, on Brian's point, the point I made earlier about documenting, I think you know, if you're in the regulated sector, you're going to need to show tangible and documented signs of assessing the emergence of these new or changing risks and how either your existing program responds to those or how you're addressing that, including staffing uh, issues that Carolina mentioned earlier. So. Those are my observations from a Canadian perspective. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, Ben, uh, wrap it up for us on this topic on what what you think the uh, the enforcement calendar looks like as you as you look at it in Sydney. Sure. Thank you, Steve. Um, the probably the the main thing we're seeing at the moment is um, regulators here are certainly at, at pains to loosen some of the requirements for um, directors and reporting obligations that's coming um, out of APRA and ASIC and the ACCC, um, all suggesting that for the short term, the reporting obligations are going to be loosened and, and temporarily suspended in some cases. But I think in terms of enforcement, it's going to be for those entities' business as usual. Um, certainly, um, as Anthony just mentioned, I'm seeing from ASIC, um, who is our corporate regulator here, uh, and overseeing um, financial crime, there's certainly going to be, there's certainly as much activity um, now um, as there was pre-COVID-19. That was put on hold probably for a month or so while I think the, the practical realities of investigators um, moving into a remote environment um, settled down, but I think that's now well and truly over. Production orders are, are coming out again for documents, and, and I think that it, it will be business as usual. The probably one practical aspect um, of uh, for corruption that um, uh, ha this has had uh, is in relation to the legislation that was introduced at the end of last year uh, into Parliament that was to be before the Senate in its first sitting this year. Uh, that has now been pushed aside, and that was a, 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 an amendment to our criminal code that was going to bring in a Deferred Prosecution Act uh, uh, for, um, for organisations, as well as a raft of reforms to our, our bribery legislation that is now on hold. Um, so I think from an from a, um, enforcement perspective, corruption is, is going to be business as usual, which is, is not particularly um, robust here in, in Australia, but I think from a financial crime um, and corporate regulator perspective, it's going to be uh, enforcement full steam ahead. Thank you, Ben. So, you know, the, 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 the good news, bad news story is perhaps uh, the enforcement community is not going to knock on your door uh, tomorrow 
uh, but perhaps the day after. But the but the other thing to to note before we go to the next topic is uh, none of your panelists are saying that you're going to get a pass uh, in terms of your compliance uh, obligations, your your duty to identify uh, inappropriate conduct and address it, your duty to to deter that. So if that's the scenario, the the next practical question is you. you Life goes on as a compliance officer, as a chief legal officer, as a, as a general counsel uh, inside the organization. And the real practical challenges that come from our circumstances we find us in are our third topic is how to conduct uh, investigations and whether to conduct uh, investigations remotely. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I want to uh, turn to Anthony and Anthony, I'm going to uh, talk about the recurring lesson from past economic crises is that organizations, either through uh, layoffs or restructuring, uh, impair the ability to go to, to knowledgeable people to secure information that could be used to figure out whether or not you've, you've done something wrong and what your level of risk is. What challenges, Anthony, do you see posed by the loss of corporate knowledge and how might business mitigate that risk? Sure, so uh, the, the severity and the immediacy of that risk uh, is gonna vary depending on the circumstances um, of the company and of the type of business, its business models. But I think a few general points can be, can be made. That the first thing is, you know, if there's an ongoing internal investigation involving uh, financial crime. Organizations need to be very wary of losing control of employees or third-party intermediaries, contractors who have direct knowledge of, of matters under investigation by making a decision to uh, lay them off temporarily or permanently, or in the case of contractors, terminating them um, without providing for some kind of uh, structure or agreement on the scope and, and basis for ongoing cooperation uh, after that layoff, you know, perhaps even on a on a compensated basis. Um, now, that, that's not only important for internal investigation purposes, but it, it's also going to impact an organization's ability to uh, meet the expectation of, of law enforcement agencies uh, who may or, or, or are already involved. And, and in turn, you know, having lost that information, having had those those large gaps, you may undermine efforts to secure full cooperation credit, or in Canada, uh, make your case for a, a deferred prosecution agreement or, or remediation agreement. We've seen recently uh, in in one case where a remediation agreement wasn't offered that they're not they're not going to get it. You don't get an easy uh, remediation agreement. So I think you need all the credit you can you can get. One thing. Uh, to mention there is if, if a law enforcement agency is involved, you may want to consult them before you make decisions around terminations or the layoff of employees who possess potentially uh, significant information. You know, frankly, I've done that even outside of, uh, of you know, COVID-19 circumstances or in, in circumstances where expecting wide-scale wide -scale layoffs. But that's something to bear in mind. The, the other thing, aside from employee or contractor information, is is needing to ensure you secure corporate records in the possession of employees, and they're located where, where they should be. Um, you know, devices and laptops of any departing employees should need to be secured, data preserved. Um, you need to know who, who has that data. Also, be mindful of employees or contractors who use ephemeral messaging platforms uh, for their third-party communications. So that's WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, Signal, those sorts of things. I'm seeing increasing, when I do internal investigations, I increasingly see you know, chatter on those platforms. Whether or not employees should under corporate policies, the reality is often they're used. You need to know before you lose control of, of employees and those devices um, whether uh, you need to take steps to obtain or preserve those kinds of records as well if you can. Um, the, the, the other... Uh, related point is you need to be, when you're working remotely, because of the consequences of working remotely, I think I'd urge companies to um, review and assess communication and record management protocols. Uh, you know, in particular, uh, privilege laws are becoming increasingly challenging to navigate in the context of compliance reviews or internal investigations. 
and I'd say that remote working means there's likely to be more email and, uh, and, tra and text flying around between a team involved in a review or investigation because they can't pop by the desk or grab a corner office for a team meeting. And that some of those communications may contain the kinds of sensitive statements that people would normally have reserved for face-to-face -face meetings. And you want to make sure that those are cloaked in privilege um, to the extent you can. And I think it's important that everyone understands what the rules of engagement are around the transmission of, uh, of communications. There's also the increased chance, I think, from remote working of, of waiving privilege by you know, sending communications outside of uh, the, the core group that's, uh, that enjoys the protection of privilege. So again, I, I'd, uh, it comes back to the importance of reviewing protocols for, uh, for communications among review team or investigation team members. Thank you, Anthony, good points. Brian, what kind of challenges uh, do you think uh, our audiences that, and in your own experience have you seen from uh, remote environments uh, in terms of effective internal investigations and what are some of your thoughts on, on how you might try to overcome those challenges? So from what I've seen in, the, in our ongoing investigations, so they predated COVID, they were in process, um, you know, we, there, there are a couple things. One, data review isn't uh, too bad as long as the company has undertaken some of the things that Anthony has talked about. So obviously following the, the guidance and ideas that he has put together is critical because if, if you don't do that, you're not in a position to then follow up and, and do the internal investigation. But, you know, we've, we've had to adjust. Um, you know, I can hold out all I want to as outside counsel and say, um, look, in-person interview for the following six reasons, all, all of which are valid. And, you know, what we'll hear in response is get it done, wrap it up, finish it, which is also really important. Whether you're doing an internal investigation that has, to, you know, that is reported internally with some decision making to be done for an internal audience or something that's ongoing. Um, that's been disclosed to the government, although I will say there's, those are slightly different tracks. Um, internally, I think there's still a lot of pressure because sometimes those investigations have to do with personnel decisions. Personnel decisions are being made already, and so maybe some of those folks are affected. But despite my holdout, you know, I have been, I have been forced to, as recently as last week, conduct important uh, uh, interviews that I otherwise would have done in person. Um, over a video platform, and there is some robust technology that is very helpful, but it is really uh, more time consuming. The communication can be more difficult. It is difficult to screen share documents if that's the if that's the situation you're in, and, and obviously um, witness interviews take different formats. Some are more combative than others, but even in a very cooperative uh, manner, it can be difficult to communicate because you can't, unlike when you're in person, you cannot evaluate the witness as well. Um, and there's also technology issues that always come up. Um, you know, there are time zone issues that create uh, their own problems. So th those practical reasons, um, you know, make me want to hold out. But the, but the truth is we just have to deal with them. You know, we just have to find a way through them because there are time limitations. On the on the other side of it, though, if it's a if it's an enforcement action involving an enforcer, and again, talking to Department of Justice lawyers last week, um, it it looks to me like my takeaway from those conversations is in most cases they're not doing witness interviews right now. They can't travel, but they have all the same concerns we do internally about an investigation. If they're going to interview a witness. Um, you know, they want to be able to observe the witness. And sometimes it's a situation where there's a, an FBI agent in the room and there's the witness's own lawyer and uh, others that, you know, normally you'd have in the room. And so if you've got to put them all on video, I think it's just too onerous right now or the, the, the government is not yet convinced that this is a way to go. And I think from scheduling conversations that have come up, I think a lot of Folks in the DOJ are, are hopeful, I was going to say optimistic, that's the wrong word, hopeful that they'll be able to sort of resume operations. I mean, I've been asked for dates in June, and, you know, I don't know that that's possible or practical, um, 
I can tell you that they're going forward with document review, right? And so we get a lot more questions about, hey, when you guys were in here, you talked about X, Y, and Z. We want some specific focus on that. Um, we need some responses. And, you know, this collection of documents, we're now going to look at those because I have time. So we've gotten those kind of requests, and, and obviously we need to comply. But without taking the steps that Anthony talked about, when, you know, you're not in a position to do, I feel like you're not in a position to do an adequate job if the investigation then comes up. If it does come up and records aren't kept, you obviously have to deal with it like in other situations. And here, honestly, there may be some leeway from prosecutors. Um, understanding, you know, from, from their position, they have some of the same issues, right? So I think there is there probably will be, depending on who you're dealing with, some, some leeway. I think you just have to be upfront about the challenges that you're you're dealing with. Good observations, Brian. Thank you, Carolina. Can you briefly talk about the importance in in, in these circumstances of whistleblower protocols and hotlines? Sure. Um, this is that is an experience in recent years uh, have demonstrated that large portions of, of cases of wrongdoing come to the attention um, of the effect of, an, or, or, of the organization because of someone inside the organization or that is close to the organization. Let's say employees, business part, the parties, and third, third parties that are close to the organization. So right now, it is critical, I think, for companies to be prepared and not to worry, but to take care. You know, you cannot just close your eyes and hope that nothing happens to you as a company. You have to have an effective system where you could uh, receive uh, an, an alert of, of wrongdoing and you, that you could easily assess it and also, you know, take care of it. Because um, the problem is that if you don't take care of those um, claims, you know, you might have bigger problems in the future. And, and as we have heard, you know, even though it's not necessarily the moment at this point where you have the enforcement activity in your door, that could be the case in the future. And um, as we have also heard, uh, remote working environments have changed the way we interact in our companies. So the dynamic of of the business and how you interact with government and with third parties will change, and you have to be prepared if something goes wrong. And you have to be prepared, you know, to receive that notice and to take care of that. And the other thing that I, I think it is important about having a, a, a well done, uh, let's say, whistleblowing system is that it gives a message uh, outside of the company not only demonstrates uh, sound governments and practice to society, markets, and regulators, but also it gives us, it, it, it adds value to your company. Somehow you give the message that you are working with transparency and that you take care of concerns that are being made from, let's say, your customers or for, you know, from other people outside your organization and that you actually have a plan, you know, to, to deal with that. So I think right now it is a, a good time to take a look at what you have internally. If you don't have uh, a whistleblowing system right now, just uh, start to implement one, uh, you know, very simple, but don't close your eyes and don't think that uh, everything is, is going to be fine uh, in the future. It might not be the case. And, and I think this is very, very important so companies could um, easily um, be aware of any risk or any exposure they might have uh, as a company during the crisis and in, 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 in the future. Thanks. Those are, those are really good observations about the importance of, of that resource. What I want to do uh, with our last topic is I'm going to uh, pose uh, a, a question again to Carolina and Ben. Um, and here's the, here's the backdrop. 
Uh, all of us uh, are that do compliance work, that do risk assessment work, uh, are accustomed to the business model uh, and how the how the client or the company uh, goes about doing its business. And that may change overnight, and who they do that through may change overnight, and and what resources they have available and have checked out, uh, including supply chains and and third parties, uh, may not be there tomorrow because of of COVID nineteen. So uh, if I could, I'd like to start with with Carolina, and then we'll go to to Ben to wrap it up. Um, what what do you think companies ought to be thinking about and doing uh, in this wildly disruptive uh, circumstances? Carolina? Um, the thing is, Steve, that um, the way I see it is um, that the search for new distribution channels to allocate, let's say, products or services somewhere else because of the crisis um, could exposure companies to new legal uh, frameworks or to new ways of doing business. And as a company, if you, know, if you are not familiar with these new legal structures or legal framework, and if you are not good or you don't have a, a due diligence process to know, uh, you know your, your third parties, you, know, you can be in trouble uh, very quick. So um, basically right now, um, the problem is that in, in, this, in this crisis, you know, this could affect you as a company and you can take rapidly decisions without thinking of a long-term, um, you know, consequence. For example, you know, it, it is very interesting that um, I have read recently that uh, despite the world crisis caused by COVID, you know, there might be foreign investors that might be willing to invest in the U.S. Um, you know, to obtain a permanent residence. So, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember that in the Great Recession back from 2008, there was a lot of cash from investors from Latin America and that drove rapid recovery in the market for houses and condos in, in Miami. So, um, you know, that might be a risk right now if, if people is, is, is urgent to grow the economy and they do not do a very good due diligence, uh, you know, with, with their business, you know, the anti-money laundering uh, problems may arise if, if you don't take care of that. So um, right now uh, what is going to happen is that companies might be uh, very aware of the situation and you need to be very, very careful as to where are you going to do business, how are you going to resolve future disputes. Uh, if something goes wrong, so you don't get in trouble. Good advice, Ben. Uh, you walk in tomorrow uh, to a disrupted uh, uh, client, and all of all of the people are saying we have to get to work right away. And you're thinking about how do I how do I explain to the client just how much their situation has changed. What do you say uh, as, you're, as you're trying to slow things down and, 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 and try to do that proper risk assessment? Um, I, I think just by way of, I guess, wrapping this, this theme up, it's probably just mindful to remember that um, how your actions now are going to be viewed by enforcement um, operators six months, 12 months from now is probably the key thing to keep in mind. Um, obviously, there is um, massive disruption to organisations and walking in and finding um, compliance teams working remotely, um, finding investigations, um, internal investigations hampered by some of the, the themes that we've already touched on today it, it is obviously going to be the new normal, but um, recognising that protocols and compliance protocols that are in place already need to adapt and adapt very quickly um, and that that will need to be explained to um, a, a regulator in, in the future about whether or not what you've done um, is adequate um, is probably going to be something to keep in mind and, and that while it isn't business as usual at the moment, um, explaining how business has been done um, in the future is, is going to be something of critical importance. You know, it's a great, it's a great nugget in there, uh, Ben, to talk about 
you know, you're immediately trying to deal with a crisis, uh, but in fact, you're you're trying to put together uh, a, a a good narrative and a good story that enforcement personnel may may be sifting through uh, a year later, uh, and that's a that's a great that's a great takeaway. Um, what we'll do, you might have noticed uh, during the the course of our presentation, and we only had an hour today, so we were really trying to just uh, give you some things to think about. And you might have seen that um, the slide that was up for a portion of, of the early part of the presentation, uh, a slide that was a checklist. And what we intend to do uh, is to send to you, we've tried to put together a, a, a checklist that um, captures some of the themes and some of the practical suggestions uh, that the panelists have, have made today uh, for you to think about. And uh, we'll email a copy of that PowerPoint to you uh, that includes the checklist, that includes how to get in touch with uh, your, your, and as you can see here, this is, this is part of the, the checklist that we put together and it's about a three-pager. Our goal was to put something very quick, not to send you a treatise. We know you all are overwhelmed with the amount of things in your inbox. And really what we were trying to do was to put together a quick little cheat sheet or checklist that you could put somewhere in your, in your, um, in your new remote office and have it available, and you could pick it up and, and take it when you go back to your work site. I've been tracking, uh, I, I haven't seen uh, too many other questions. Uh, shoot uh, us a, a quick question here um, if, if you have one. And in the meantime, let me encourage all of you to reach out to our panelists. The email uh, uh, information for each panelist is included in the PowerPoint. I know for certain some of you did not want to ask questions that pertain to your particular organization. But uh, these are terrific lawyers and they'd be happy to connect with you, uh, follow up if you have questions that you, you didn't um, have an opportunity or didn't feel comfortable raising with us today. Uh, let me uh, finish as, as we started. Thank you all for, for joining our webinar and we hope that um, you and those close to you are safe and well and we'll continue to, to, to be that way uh, as, as we all get through this. Thanks again for joining and we're adjourned.